Okay, I think we're ready to get started. Good, people can hear me, thumbs up. Excellent. So, so it's my great pleasure today to be able to introduce Joe Handelsman, um, who's joining us for this IGB Pioneers Seminar. Um, and, and Joe truly is a pioneer in many areas of science and a lot of areas of science um, th that uh, are so important that they've become buzzwords today. Um, buzzwords like the microbiome or the metagenome. And Joe really scientifically pioneered in both of these areas. Um, I promised her I wouldn't mention a year, but, but back in the day when metagenome was really kind of a pipe dream, um, her lab pioneered the um, the ability to clone really large fragments of environmental DNA um, and get sequence reads of long contiguous stretches of different microbiology uh, of bacterial chromosome sequences. And this was long before the day of, of Illumina sequencing or long read pack biosequencing. And it really um, pioneered our, our entry into this field. It gave us our first glimpse um, at what was going on in the microbial world. Um, she did some really seminal studies in the microbiome area, um, picking, I think, very presciently natural microbial communities, for example, the one um, inhabiting the larva of gypsy moth, which was a very simple microbial community to try and understand how microbes interact with each other and with their host. And she has really beautiful publications in each of these areas. Um, I would say Joe is also a pioneer in the larger role of science in society. Um, she's been a passionate advocate um, for underrepresented groups in sciences, for women in sciences. She's pioneered science education um, techniques and she's published extensively in, in both of these areas. She was associate director of the Office of Science um, at the White House during the Obama administration. And so I think in multiple ways, scientifically and societally, Joe has been a pioneer. And I'm really thrilled to, to have her here to give this virtual seminar today. Um, so Joe, thanks very much. And uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Well, thanks, Bill, for uh, the generous introduction. I, I certainly hope I can live up to that. Uh, it's a real honor to be uh, here for the, uh, here virtually anyway, for the Pioneer um, Lecture, and I'm going to just share my screen. Can you see that? My slide? You can see my slide? Okay. Okay. We good? Full screen? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so, uh, so thank you all for being here under uh, these difficult conditions. All our campuses are kind of tortured these days by COVID and everything it's doing to our student bodies and our other towns we live in. So I appreciate you having the focus to come to a seminar on um, microbial communities. So I wanted to talk today about um, a different approach than the one that Bill mentioned uh, to the idea of complexity made simple. And so Bill mentioned our work on gypsy moths and eventually on Drosophila um, gut microbiomes. And those are very simple communities naturally. But the communities that have always interested me are the really complex ones like the human gut and particularly soil. And so when I came back from uh, my work at the White House and started um, uh, my research program again, I decided to take a risk and try what a lot of people through most of my career had said you really never want to do because it's so artificial. And that was to create a simple community from a complex community. And interestingly, in the couple of years since we've done this, uh, a whole new area of synthetic communities has arisen. And I'll tell you the, the difference in our minds uh, between uh, synthetic communities and model communities. But this has become a lot more mainstream than it was when we, when we started. So the challenges that we're trying to deal with are that these microbiomes of the complex ones are enormously complex. So if you think of the human microbiome, it has about 100 to 1,000 fold more genetic variation 
than the human genome. Well, we know how long it took us to sequence and begin to understand the human genome. So the human microbiome is obviously way behind that, but that's, that's the, the magnitude of the complexity we're dealing with. The soil is even more complex. The uh, microbiome by our estimates is at least tenfold and maybe as much as a hundredfold more um, species diverse um, than uh, the human microbiome. So the challenge there is gonna be even greater. Um, we also have in microbiology, in my mind, a lack of governing principles for some of the very key community uh, activities. So for example, what controls community establishment? You know, how does a community come together from a group of organisms and form in a particular structure? Because there are communities that will form the same way every time, and we don't know what it is that drives that process. We also don't understand uh, the basis for stability. So what keeps a community uh, from changing in the face of perturbation, and particularly the perturbation of invasion? So what are the properties of a microorganism that enable it to invade? And then what are the properties of a community that enable it to resist invasion? All of that uh, is, I, I think, a very critical element of our future as we begin to not only understand microbiomes, but then apply our knowledge to changing microbiomes. If we don't understand uh, how to invade them or how to prevent invasion or how to keep them uh, whole and functional, then it's gonna be very difficult to manipulate them for either human health or environmental uh, health or agriculture. So we thought we needed a simple community that would represent the very complex community, not a naturally occurring simple one. And that's really tough uh, to figure out um, who to include in such a community and how to construct it. And so I'd like to go through in a little bit of a painstaking way how we found each of the members and why we chose to include uh, each one. But the goal in the end was to have a model community that was genetically and chemically tractable. We focus on small molecules, so we definitely wanted to be able to look at the full metabolome. Uh, we also wanted to look at the uh, full genetic complement, so we want to be able to make mutants and um, put together a community with various mutations uh, in, in the, the organisms in it. And then eventually we need to build data, very large data sets into quantitative models uh, and, and ultimately compare our community with the behaviors of other communities. And so that I think is what will get us on the road to beginning to have uh, the, these um, global principles or governing principles for microbial communities. So what we're looking for is a model system that was simple, but relevant, and this is, this is the really hard part. You can, you can put together any set of organisms you want and have something simple, but the question is how do you find something that's relevant? And this is where I di diverge from synthetic community people because synthetic communities are teaching us an enormous amount about microbial communication and interactions, but they are just communities uh, of members who were drawn from the same natural habitat. And we don't know before we create those whether they actually interact in the natural habitat. A model community is one where we have evidence of interactions in the, in the, the native habitat. And therefore, we have reason to believe that the interactions we're seeing in vitro will carry out into um, the natural world. They're both, in my opinion, valid approaches, but we set the higher um, bar, I think, in terms of keeping it simple, but then also um, having, having uh, the relevance that the organisms actually interact in nature. And so that's, that leads me to introduce you to our community, Thor. And so I'd like to explain where Thor came from. So Thor started with a screen of rhizosphere organisms. And this was, Bill was kind enough not to mention, but I will mention, this is 35 years ago now, we, uh, my lab did a screen for, and we, by the way, did have color film back uh, in those days. The black and white is an artifact here. So I just want to reassure you, I'm not that old that I predated uh, color photography. Uh, but this represents an assay for uh, damping off of alfalfa, which is a disease caused 
find all mice eat pathogens. These are protists that live in soil and on plants, many environments, and they produce these, these lovely um, packets of swimming uh, spores called zoospores. And they are uh, enormously impactful on agriculture. In fact, if you've heard of the Irish potato famine, that was caused um, by an oomycete on potatoes. It was also caused by the British, but that's another story. Uh, so we looked at damping off caused by Phytophthora, which is one oomycete, uh, on alfalfa seedlings. And what we did was to screen organisms, very, very simple and naive approach, but it was to simply screen organisms that came from healthy alfalfa roots around the state of Wisconsin and examine those that were able to suppress the disease caused by Phytophthora. So this is an example of where uh, there were two, some test tubes with three out of three um, seedlings still standing after the assay. You can see the other ones are kind of uh, keeled over and dried up. And then we would retest any that gave us 100% survival um, in the first test. So this is an example of the kind of protection that we would see. This is Phytophthora alone, uh, and this is Phytophthora plus uh, the final one that we chose, which is a strain of Bacillus cereus uh, that we call UW85. Uh, this Bacillus is uh, very common in soil. Bacillus cereus is actually better known for its ability to induce um, food poisoning, but it's ubiquitous in soil. By our estimates, it represents about 10 to the fifth uh, colony forming units in just about every soil that we've looked at. It's a great organism to work with because although it wasn't initially that genetically tractable, uh, it forms uh, very stable spores and um, the, that makes it just very easy to store. It makes it very easy also to develop something that might go into the field because you can coat seeds with um, the bacillus culture and the seeds will lose viability long before the bacteria die. The bacteria will remain for many years um, uh, in viable form. So we found, uh, we were looking for the mechanism of how does bacillus cereus suppress plant disease. We screened for mutants that uh, lack the ability to suppress disease. And we ended up hitting a set of genes that are involved in producing zwittermycin. And here's um, a, a one version of the zwittermycin molecule um, that we found in the 1990s, but I'm gonna go back to uh, zwittermycin later in the talk. I'll just say for now that it's a very unusual antibiotic. It's still the only one in its class of amino poly polyol antibiotics. And it turned out, we found out later on, synthesized by a truly exotic um, mechanism. And I'll tell you about that um, later. It turns out that uh, Bacillus cereus in all the soils that we looked at uh, produced this uh, molecule. About 10 to 20% of the Bacillus cereus isolate in any soil uh, produce wittermycin. So why it took so long to discover this molecule is uh, still unknown. We suspect it was because we were screening for survival of plants. We weren't looking for antibiotic activity, which is actually really hard to see with zwittermycin um, on petri plates, uh, but is very powerful. The organism, so serious, is very powerful as a disease suppressive agent. So it really stood out in that assay. But that's only one explanation for why an organism that occurs probably around the world at 10 to the fourth uh, or two times 10 to the fourth um, uh, CFUs per, per gram of soil uh, are producing zwittermycin. That's a pretty extraordinary amount uh, of bacterial inoculum producing this, this antibiotic. So one of our hypotheses is that this is in fact one of the most abundant antibiotics on earth because uh, the producer is so common uh, across the world. So uh, we then began to think about when we, when we went to, um, to, pre to developing um, the model system that we now call Thor, we decided we would use Bacillus cereus because we knew it came from plant roots and we were particularly interested in rhizosphere interactions, which are interactions that occur on plant roots and around plant roots. And we know a lot about Bacillus series. We know it produces interesting metabolites and we can do genetics on it. And we had a full genome sequence. So we decided to start with Bacillus. But then the question is, uh, what do we, 
what else do we use um, to make a community? So one of the first observations that one of my graduate students, uh, Greg Gilbert made, he's a professor at um, UC Santa Cruz now, uh, he, when he was studying the microbial communities using culture techniques uh, back in the 80s and 90s, um, he found that when you inoculated soybean seeds in the field with uh, Bacillus cereus, he would see this enormous flush of uh, growth of bacteria in the Flavobacterium cytophica group. And these are the gliding bacteria that occur very commonly in soil. And he found that the flush was so dramatic that in, in some of his uh, experiments, 30% of the bacteria he would recover from roots that had been inoculated with Bacillus cereus were the flavor bacterium or Cytophaga. And he then found another observation, which I didn't believe at the time, and I told him he was a plant pathology student, so perhaps he wasn't doing good microbiology. Um, and that was uh, really unfortunate of me, but eventually I did listen to him. The reason that I, I was suspicious is that he told me that when he put his plates with uh, Bacillus cereus isolates in the fridge, uh, after about three weeks, he would start seeing these other things coming out, these yellow slimy things. And the uh, Cytophaga flavor bacteria that he saw on roots were also yellow. So I just figured, okay, he didn't know how to keep a pure culture and I dismissed it. But then uh, later on, another student reported exactly the same thing. And he said this was happening pretty frequently. And then a third person found it. And I said, okay, these are all good microbiologists. We have to start listening to them. Maybe there's some odd phenomenon here that Bacillus cereus, and this is only on Bacillus we see this. We don't see this with any other um, uh, cultured organism, that Bacillus cereus maybe carries something along with it either in its spores or around its spores. We still don't know the mechanism of this. So we started looking at this seriously and, and quantifying it. And sure enough, we found that when you take uh, root organisms, and this is an interesting aspect because it doesn't happen with Bacillus cereus from soil. So far, we have only seen it with Bacillus cereus from roots. And why that is, we don't know. But if you take the cultured organisms from soil, and then you colony purify them and it looks like you have a perfectly pure culture of Bacillus cereus members um, and they can just be spotted by colony morphology. And then you um, isolate them, uh, you take the pure cultures and put them uh, on plates in the fridge. About 5% of them will show this phenotype of the, the yellow slimy things coming out. And sometimes they're not yellow and sometimes they're not slimy, but that's the most common phenotype. Once that happens, we were able to um, isolate the Cytophaga and Flavobacterium-like organisms very consistently um, from the bacillus. And then it was easy to culture these in pure culture and uh, under the normal conditions, it's easy to culture bacillus cereus under um, uh, lab conditions in pure culture. So now we had two organisms um, and we wanted to know what is the frequency that these are all Flavobacterium or um, Cytophaga? So we did a large study of soybean root isolates, isolated many Bacillus cereus um, uh, colonies from uh, field-grown uh, soybean roots. And we found that 83% of the co-isolates that we uh, uncovered were from the Bacteroidetes phy phylum, which is the phylum that contains the Flavobacteria that you see here. And when we looked at random root isolates, uh, the random root isolates are distributed across the phyla. Um, and in fact, Bacteroidetes is not uh, even the most common phylum uh, among those. So there's some selection among what we now call uh, hitchhikers on the Bacillus series. There's some selection for members of the Bacteroidetes. And we began to take a closer look at the Flavobacterium and uh, Cytophaga group. Uh, the name Thor comes from the hitchhikers of the rhizosphere, so that's uh, what Thor is made up of, is Bacillus cereus and its hitchhikers. So one of my graduate students, um, uh, Brooke Peterson, started looking at um, the Bacteroidetes um, <clears throat> and, and asking uh, what 
what was unique about this relationship? And her first hypothesis was a simple one, that maybe Bacillus was enabling the Bacteroidetes to grow uh, on the root. So she tested um, organisms in cult regular culture, just standard culture media, trypic soy uh, broth or something else, or in root exudate. And she found that in root exudate, uh, so what you see here are um, day zero inoculum, and then after five days, uh, how much, how many cells you have in a pure culture. And so in this case, it's flavor bacterium Johnsonii. And then after five days of a mixed culture, how much flavor bacterium is there? So that's what we're looking at. So the CFUs here are all flavor bacterium. And, or, or with whatever the test bacteroidetes member is. And so what we're doing with the pure culture is just adding bacillus cereus. And what you can see is that for most of these, many of them, um, the growth was pretty limited. Um, it, they just sort of stopped at a pretty low CFU um, in pure culture when they were grown on root exudate. But when we added Bacillus cereus, we found um, that they grew just fine. And this was dramatically uh, more uh, noticeable in Bacteroidetes strains. So this half of the graph is the Bacteroidetes, and then these are some of the others, uh, very few of which were stimulated uh, by Bacillus cereus, and those are non-Bacteroidetes. So there was something among all of these um, members of the Bacteroidetes that enabled them to grow in the presence of Bacillus cereus uh, at levels they could not achieve without Bacillus cereus. But in pure culture, in other media, they were all fine. So this is something specific to root exudate and certainly presents at least a testable hypothesis about why they might be hitchhiking, that they're getting some sort of nutrition uh, from Bacillus cereus. And so Brooke looked further and asked, well, what is it that Bacillus is feeding them and found that it was fragments of peptidoglycan that are sloughed off by bacillus into the medium. And the growth uh, effect was really quite um, linear with increasing uh, concentrations of peptidoglycan. And this was the only element of the bacillus cereus uh, culture that stimulated growth. So it seemed that in root exudate, there isn't a carbon source that um, the flavor bacteria can use, uh, well, all the bacteroidetes, and they can use uh, fragments of peptidoglycan as a carbon source. So this was enabling them to grow in a carbon um, starvation environment. So that certainly justified the, uh, the linkage between Bacillus cereus and these various bacteroidetes uh, strains made it look like they might be some interesting uh, candidates for, um, for our uh, model community. So more recently, we found in studying the flavor bacterium Johnsonii interaction with bacillus that flavor bacterium has a really peculiar uh, mechanism of movement that we've named the walking biofilm because there is no other example like it of a real, of a true biofilm locomoting uh, across a surface. And that's exactly what this organism does. And so the, uh, the assay here is simply looking at flavor bacterium on plates. And when it's uh, normally on plates, it'll just glide along the surface using gliding motility apparatus. And when we uh, incubate it under uh, low, low oxygen uh, under an oil droplet, uh, we find that the uh, flavor bacterium begins to <laughs> do this weird pinwheeling uh, motion, which other people have observed, and they named it pinwheeling, where one end of the cell remains attached to the surface and the other end spins around. Um, then the, the cells begin to aggregate into a biofilm, and the evidence that it's a biofilm is uh, partly that it's held together by polysaccharides, and it does seem to be a, a firm uh, aggregate uh, in total. And these then do not roll, but they move along the surface uh, that they're put on, and it seems to be the pinwheeling motion that drives the locomotion across the surface. Later on, sometimes they fuse and form very large aggregates, and we've started calling these large ones zorbs, 
So these zorbs are biofilms that stay together for a period of time, but then uh, after about 15 hours, they begin to disaggregate and they stop uh, moving and they no longer form a biofilm. So I wanted to show you what this looks like, uh, but this, this uh, movie is gonna show you what the flavobacterium does when it's with Bacillus cereus. So in this case, the flavobacterium is labeled in uh, red or orange, and the bacillus is labeled in green. And so you can see individual cells of the flavobacterium starting to aggregate at this point. And now you can see the full aggregates and they're even starting to take on some of their uh, orange color. But if you look a little bit later, you begin to see these green centers. Let's watch it one more time. Uh, the green centers are bacillus. So the zorbs are forming, but if bacillus is present, it seems to somehow get inside of the zorbs and it's uh, completely surrounded by flavobacterium cells. So we don't know yet uh, too much about these. We know a couple of the genes that are required in the flavor bacterium to form the zorbs. Um, we're interested in the fact that eventually the bacillus pops the zorb and the flavor bacteria disperse, but the bacillus remains as an intact biofilm. Uh, and we'll be studying that more in, um, in the future. So we don't know the significance of the zorbs, but we do know and given that Flavobacterium was a hitchhiker on Bacillus cereus, it's kind of interesting that they have this very intimate relationship in vitro, uh, forming this zorb where Flavobacterium is inside Bacillus. So what we now have, we chose Flavobacterium as the second member of, of Thor. We have an organism that was hitchhiking on Bacillus cereus, so that was uh, a field to lab um, translocation uh, of the interaction. And then we know in the lab, the bacillus will feed flavor bacterium its peptidoglycan under conditions where the um, flavor bacterium can't grow. It doesn't have a carbon source. We also know that the flavor bacterium forms the zorbs that encapsulate the bacillus. We don't know the meaning of that, but again, it's a very uh, intimate interaction. So what we're looking for ultimately are community phenotypes. We're looking for the things that happen in a community when only all the members of the community are there, community-specific phenotypes. So in order to have a community and not just a binary interaction, we needed a third member for Thor. So we looked back at our hitchhikers and we decided to try the ones that were not members of the Bacteroidetes. They are the, the, the non-Bacteroidetes uh, ones are the minority, but there were several that came up repeatedly. And so we did what we called a, a hierarchy network analysis of all the organisms that we pulled out um, from the rhizosphere. We used both just rhizosphere isolates and then members that it hitchhiked. And we looked at inhibitory interactions. And so organisms were scored by whether they inhibited some other strain and then whether they were inhibited by the other strain. So the highest score was if they had interactions going both ways. And we found that consistently one organism uh, was at the very top of um, the hierarchy and seemed to be extremely inhibitory to other strains, um, but also had uh, other kinds of interactions. It also would respond to other strains. So that uh, organism uh, was a Pseudomonas that we eventually typed to uh, Pseudomonas coriensis, uh, not your uh, everyday Pseudomonas. And we wanted to ask then, uh, what is, how does it interact with uh, other hitchhikers? And we found that um, when we put the Pseudomonas with other random hitchhikers, um, we found um, that they grew just fine. So the blue here is the hitchhiker alone and the orange is with um, the Pseudomonas coriensis. And you can see that all of these uh, grow pretty much uh, similarly. There's no statistical um, difference. But when we put these isolates, which turn out to be all the Bacteroidetes isolates from um, the rhizosphere uh, and from hitchhikers, all of those were dramatically inhibited. So you can see the orange bars are not even uh, visible because the Pseudomonas coriensis completely inhibits growth of the, the flavor bacterium and other bacteroidetes. 
So that suggested that there was a pretty interesting interaction that would make the Pseudomonas a candidate for Thor because it's a specific inhibition for Bacteroidetes. And there's no known antibiotic that's specific to the Bacteroidetes group. So we've, we thought there might be something new here. And sure enough, uh, we found that uh, through structural analysis with Jason Crawford's lab at Yale, we found that Pseudomonas coriensis uh, produces several metabolites that are um, inhibitory uh, to flavor bacterium. And one is particularly uh, uh, responsible for the activity and that we call coriensin B. It's a little bit hard to ascribe uh, the activity directly because these compounds tend to interchange and are um, uh, unstable, but there's a high correlation that when coriancin B is present, we have activity and when it's not, we don't. Uh, and so the other um, molecules that are similar have much lower activity um, and are modifications of coriancin B. We <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, identified the coriancin uh, biosynthetic pathway. And it has uh, some interesting elements I'm not going to go into today because I want to get back to the community. Um, but it does seem to be an interesting um, antibiotic. One thing that we found um, particularly intriguing is that there are plant compounds that are like coriancin. And this is one that's kind of famous because it's in the conosine family which is a set of molecules produced by hemlock. And those molecules turn out to be the toxic uh, part of hemlock that um, Socrates used, I believe, to uh, commit suicide. So this is, there are some famous paintings that have um, a conosine connection in them. So that, that pathway is the one in plants, but you can see it's actually a, mechanistically a somewhat different pathway to get to a similar molecule, uh, which is the coriancin B in bacteria. So there's an interesting parallel, but not a co-opted pathway. They're not um, identical um, mechanisms for biosynthesis, but they're parallel between the bacteria and the plants. So we thought that coriancin qualified uh, Pseudomonas to be in Thor, and we started looking at the interaction a little bit more um, in detail and particularly in the context of the community. So in this graph, we're looking at flavor bacterium growth over time. And when flavor bacterium is alone, it grows just fine. When uh, Pseudomonas is added, it takes a little bit of time, but, um, but the population uh, goes down pretty quickly. Oh, so I think I had the, I think I just changed slides, sorry. Uh, so this is the, uh, the blue is the uh, flavor bacterium alone. Um, with red, we're seeing um, with Pseudomonas, good killing. Uh, and that's the coriancin that's active. If we do it with a mutant of Pseudomonas that doesn't produce coriancin, we don't see that inhibition. But when we add the bacillus, it appears to protect uh, flavor bacterium from coriancin. And through some um, uh, really nice chemistry, uh, my graduate student, uh, Gabrielle Lozano, showed that the mechanism of protection is actually that it suppresses production of coriancin by, um, in uh, um, Pseudomonas. So then we found another interaction, which is really the strangest one because it seems counterintuitive at first. When we looked at the interaction of Pseudomonas coriensis and flavobacterium, it appeared that flavobacterium was inducing production of coriensin, the, the very molecule that kills it, which seems kind of dumb on its part, but um, biology is what it is. And so the experiment here is where we're growing um, coriensis, P. coriensis alone, or P. coriensis with flavobacterium johnsonii. And when we then take the cell-free extract from those cultures and add it to a fresh culture of flavor bacterium, we find that flavor bacterium grows fine um, in uh, just the coriensis uh, um, cell-free extract. But when the coriensis had been grown with F. Johnson, Johnson I, we do not see growth. And then we elaborated on that to determine that it was in fact the antibiotics, uh, uh, the coriancin antibiotics that differed, and it seemed to be uh, coriancin B 
that was produced in relatively small quantities um, with when P. coriensis was grown alone and really increased by a factor of almost five when the two were grown together. And so it seemed that uh, we had yet another interaction that Flavobacterium induces the antibiotic uh, that kills it to be produced by Pseudomonas. We began to look on plates at the effects of these organisms on each other in uh, the community and in pairs. And we found that Bacillus was dramatically affected uh, morphologically by the other members of the community. So this is Bacillus alone at day two and Bacillus uh, after day five, it forms these very interesting irregular uh, margin colonies. But when we add Flavobacterium, we see these, what I call dendritic uh, structures growing out from uh, the colony of Bacillus. And when we add uh, Pseudomonas coriansum, coriensis, we see uh, a little bit of that at day two, but at day five, the bacillus has uh, just uh, zipped out to an uh, enormous uh, diameter in these dendritic growths. Uh, we don't have a mechanism for that yet, so I can't tell you more about it, but it is one other indication that these organisms interact um, in vitro and perhaps in vivo. We wanted to see what they do on roots, and so, because that's where they all came from. So we looked at a, a labeled bacillus, this is GFP month bacillus on soybean roots. So this is where um, fla the, the hitchhikers came from, this bacillus isolated on soybean roots, or from soybean roots. And you can see that at the, um, on the soybean root, um, there's an interesting uh, uh, accumulation at the root tip. Uh, of these uh, bacillus colonies. But this becomes much more dramatic when we add Flavobacterium. You can see you get a much uh, darker uh, zone uh, of, of fluorescence when Flavobacterium is present. And that seems to be an enrichment, particularly at the root tip. When we add bacillus and pseudomonas, we see actually an inhibition of colonization of the root. And when we add all three, the Flavobacterium is able to bring back a little bit of colonization, but not much. So there's something going on between the Bacillus and Flavobacterium that uh, encourages root colonization, but then Pseudomonas seems to inhibit that interaction, and that's something we're definitely pursuing. So if we um, go back to uh, Thor and ask what are the interactions here, we know that both Flavobacterium and Pseudomonas came from uh, bacillus cultures, so they were hitchhikers, um, and they both induced dendritic growth of bacillus in culture. Bacillus feeds Flavobacterium peptidoglycan. Flavobacterium induces coriancin production in Pseudomonas. The coriancin, in turn, uh, kills Flavobacterium, and bacillus reduces coriancin production by, um, by the Pseudomonas um, coriensis. Uh, we also know that there's this really bizarre uh, walking biofilm phenotype of the Zorbs where Flavobacterium will actually encapsulate Bacillus cereus and they can move as a gliding um, biofilm as a unit. But what this leaves out is what are the phenotypes that would occur only in the presence of the community? And we could argue that uh, the bacillus reducing coriancin phenotype um, is a product of the three-way interaction because you can see Flavobacterium growing when they're all present and not when it's just the two of them alone. Um, but we wanted to see if there was something that was truly community specific. And we found that in fact uh, the formation of biofilms, so this is not under the Zorb conditions, this is just a standard biofilm in a polystyrene plate, uh, was in fact uh, evidence for three-way interaction. So Pseudomonas coriensis is the only one that produces any significant amount of biofilm by itself. You can see the other two uh, do not produce biofilm. In pairs, there's only a very slight increase in biofilm formation uh, with one pair, and that's when bacillus is added to uh, Pseudomonas. Um, Flavobacterium uh, and, and bacillus do not form um, uh, biofilm uh, with each other when the two are together. But when we add all three, 
uh, we see a significant increase in biofilm formation. So there is something that the three of them do together that is not represented by e any of the pairs um, and certainly not represented in the single. So there's something um, that induces Pseudomonas to produce an extra amount of biofilm when uh, Flavobacterium and Bacillus are there. And the interesting thing about this is that the blue background here is Pseudomonas cells. So you can see they're, they're labeled um, in blue. The pink or red cells are Flavobacterium and the green ones are uh, Bacillus. And what's noticeable in the triple biofilm is that Bacillus and Flavobacterium are not very abundant. They represent 10% or less uh, at any time uh, during the life of the biofilm, and Pseudomonas is the vast um, majority of the cells. But that, to me, is even more intriguing because it says that minor members of the community can have a dramatic effect on the total community behavior. And so what we suspect is that there's some sort of signaling between Bacillus and Flavobacterium that then somehow interacts with Pseudomonas to increase uh, biofilm production. And that brings me back to uh, Zwittermycin, which I mentioned before. <clears throat> this is the antibiotic produced by Bacillus, and it inhibits Phytophthora on plates, but it also inhibits uh, many bacteria. And in fact, we've done most of the genetics based on its inhibition of um, enteric bacteria. One interesting sidelight is that Bacillus also produces kenosamine. We found that most of the Zwittermycin producers also produce kenosamine, and that was a little bit mysterious <coughs> until <clears throat> we began to look at how Zwittermycin is synthesized. So we started with <clears throat> a genetic analysis, knocking out the Zwittermycin pathway, and Michael Thomas, who's one of my more talented uh, colleagues, looked at this, and this was now back um, probably 15 or 18 years ago, uh, and he simply looked at the pathway and the genes that we were um, turning up, and he predicted that this would be the mode of synthesis. <clears throat> and what was remarkable about that was that he predicted that there'd be two new starter units. So the starter units are what polyketide synthesis uses as the starting material um, to begin making these chains and elongating uh, chains in polyketide synthesis. At the time we did this work, there were only two known uh, starter units, and Michael predicted that there were two more and that they would both show up <clears throat> in Zwittermycin biosynthesis. And I thought, well, that's a, that's a nice model, but um, I thought it was <clears throat> impossible that somebody could divine all of that from looking at Zwittermycin's structure and a few genes. But in fact, uh, Michael did go on to uh, demonstrate that in fact, these two intermediates do exist and a complete analysis of all the enzymes involved in Zwittermycin biosynthesis <coughs> revealed that it really has a fascinating mode of biosynthesis that is a fusion of uh, polyketide synthesis and non-ribosomal peptide synthesis. And there are now several molecules that are synthesized by that kind of hybrid <coughs> mechanism, but Zwittermycin was very early in that. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> one of the interesting things that I promised I'd tell you about is that embedded in this pathway is the pathway for kenosamine synthesis. And this is one of the very few examples of <coughs> an antibiotic biosynthetic pathway embedded in another one. And that's why we kept finding them, <coughs> excuse me, I'm so sorry. Um, that's why we kept finding these two antibiotics <coughs> In the, in the same um, <clears throat> strains because the kenosamine pathway is actually embedded in the larger biosynthetic pathway. <coughs> so to get back to our community, <clears throat> we um, <clears throat> tested Zwittermycin just because we know so much about it <clears throat> after studying it for all these years and asked whether it affects the biofilm uh, formed by Pseudomonas. And we found that, in fact, 
uh, biofilm formation. So here we're looking at absorbance um, based on uh, <clears throat> based on a, um, crystal violet measurement um, of the biofilm. So increasing numbers is more biofilm. Come back here. And on, with increasing concentrations of zwittermycin, we see an increase in production of the biofilm. And this is at relatively low levels of zwittermycin um, in the few microgram level. Um, <clears throat> we tested this um, at, with several different combinations uh, to see whether this was a, uh, a effective in the community as well. And the answer was that as long as the zwittermycin and the pseudomonas is there, I'm sorry, I didn't say this is pseudomonas alone. Um, and as long as the pseudomonas is there, we see the effect. It's not dependent upon the entire community. Uh, so flavor whether flavor bacterium is there or not, we see an increase um, of biofilm formed by pseudomonas, um, either in pairs um, or uh, in the total community. So we suspect that there's something else going on because we know that um, we get more biofilm when all three are present than when just two of them are present and when just bacillus is present with the pseudomonas. So there has to be something more than zwittermycin, something that involves um, flavobacterium. And it could be flavobacterium inducing production of more zwittermycin or it could be a completely different mechanism that's under study right now. So we have, again, more evidence that this um, interaction uh, among these three organisms is, uh, one, seems to be very intimate. They seem to affect each other's growth and behaviors in many different ways. And two, uh, is mediated in large part by small molecules, as many bacterial behaviors are. So current work that uh, I'll just uh, give you a glimpse of to see where we're going is looking at the characteristics of Flavobacterium johnsonii that are required for community specific behaviors. And so we use the TNSeq system, which is a massively parallel screen for mutants, where you put the entire collection of transposon mutants uh, under some sort of selection and then look at <clears throat> the presence and absence of uh, all the each of the transposons before and after the selection. So, and then we look for transposon mutants that have disappeared or have become much more abundant uh, under the conditions of interest. And so in this case, we uh, looked before and after at the community. So we uh, looked at the baseline, so baseline genes were all those required for individual growth. And then we looked at those right required for colonization of sand grains, sand being the most abundant particle in uh, usually in most soils, and also the I think probably the most abundant substance on Earth, silicon dioxide, because there are um, so many uh, deserts on Earth. We also looked at survival of the uh, of the Flavobacterium mutants in the microbial community, so in the triple community. And then we looked at colonization of sand in the community. And so those are the, the main conditions. Just a few tidbits <clears throat> from our very preliminary analysis. We look at the sand specific community specific genes. So these are genes that only turned up as being required for Flavobacterium to grow or survive on sand in the community. So these are genes that aren't required for either its growth on sand by itself or its community in other conditions without uh, sand present. So community specific genes, um, we found uh, 43 that were sand community specific. And interestingly, 15 of them were glycosyl transferases. So we suspect that uh, many of them will turn out to be involved in extracellular polysaccharide production, and that's uh, under analysis right now. And that makes sense because we know that uh, EPS is required for many uh, surface interactions in bacteria. And then we have five uh, hypothetical proteins that we're particularly excited about because the prediction from this uh, experiment was that if there are truly community specific genes in bacteria, many of them should be not annotated. Because 
most screens for mutants and most studies of genes have not been studied in communities. And so you would expect if these genes are only required within the community uh, condition, then they would have been, they would have eluded uh, detection and characterization. And in fact, yes, we did find a pretty high frequency of hypothetical proteins that we'll be pursuing. Uh, one of the sans specific uh, <clears throat> community specific uh, operons is kind of an interesting one because it's involved in sialic acid uh, biosynthesis, which is not something we think about a lot in bacteria. It tends to be more in the human pathogenesis that um, we uh, think of sialic acid as being important and not in soil bacteria. And so we uh, have sequenced the whole uh, flavor bacteria and genome, we have the sequence of this pathway, and we're going to be looking at um, the role of sialic acid in colonization of sand uh, in the community. And again, we don't know what's needed for that phenotype to be um, in a community on sand, why that's so different, that there are all these genes that are specific to that condition, uh, but as you can imagine, that's uh, the thrust of our work uh, at the moment. So uh, I hope I've convinced you that Thor is uh, a useful model system, that we have several phenotypes that transfer from the lab, uh, from the field to the lab, and several phenotypes that indicate very intimate interactions uh, among these organisms, even through, either through natural products or in the case um, of Zorbs, uh, through uh, direct contact or through um, the changes in colony morphology on plates. And we even have uh, phenotypes that now are specific to the triple community, including the augmented biofilm that requires uh, both organisms to be there, uh, even though we can get some augmentation uh, or increase in biofilm production with squittermycin alone, uh, we get more um, uh, <coughs> enhancement uh, when both Flavobacterium and Bacillus are present with uh, P. coriensis. So to me, uh, the community-specific phenotypes and now genes uh, are the indication that living in a community is truly a unique uh, characteristic of bacteria, that they really do have genes dedicated to their community existence um, that are not necessarily needed in single existence or in binary interactions. So with that, I would like to thank all the great people who did this work. Uh, Greg Gilbert was the intrepid graduate student who ignored me when I told him he was a bad microbiologist uh, and found the hitchhikers. Brooke Peterson then really defined that system and the frequency and nature of the uh, hitchhikers. Gabrielle Lozano uh, was responsible for putting Thor together with both the hitchhikers. Juan Bravo was an undergraduate who worked with Gabrielle and uh, characterized the Coriensin pathway. And then uh, these five postdocs have done various aspects of uh, Thor with um, <clears throat> Amanda Hurley focusing on, uh, particularly on the biofilm work, as well as the Zorb uh, discovery. Um, and Mark Chevret doing a lot of the bioinformatics and Julia Nepper finding the Zwittermycin effect on biofilms. Uh, I also can't uh, give a, a seminar without acknowledging the great people that made it possible for me uh, to go to the White House. And that, those were Eric Stab, who was a former student of mine and now a professor at uh, University of Illinois, Chicago. And Nicole Broderick, also a former graduate student who's now a professor at uh, Hopkins. And the two of them were kind enough to take care of my lab, each for uh, well, a year for Eric and two years for Nicole. Uh, while I was at the White House, because the White House had very strict ethic ru ethics rules in those days, very different White House, uh, and wouldn't let me uh, run my lab uh, while I was in the White House. I was only allowed to visit about once a month. So I'm ultimately indebted to both Eric and Nicole for the formation of Thor, because uh, my lab couldn't have survived without their fantastic mentoring. Uh, Mark Martin came up with the hitchhiker word, and I'll always be grateful for that. Jason Crawford and his lab did the chemistry on the, on the Coriensins. And Dave Beebe and uh, Chow Wee are the two responsible for um, the system that led to the discovery of Zorbs.
And with that, I think I'll stop and take questions. Joe, that was an excellent talk. It, obvious that you continue to be a pioneer in the field. Um, so I'll just remind all the people listening, uh, send questions to Joe, to me in the, in the chat, and I will relay those uh, to Dr. Handelsman. Um, so Joe, I have a couple questions here from Rachel Whitaker. Uh, the first is she'd like to know how variable are the gene islands for Coriensin and Zwittermycin among the strains? Are they on mobile elements? Uh, no, they're not. Um, Bacillus has uh, plasmids, but um, the zwittermycin pathway is on the chromosome. Coriancin also seems to be on the chromosome. Um, so there may, they, they may become mobile under some circumstances. There was an indication of some um, interesting repeat, um, repeat sequences at either end of the Coriancin pathway. Um, but we've so far found no evidence um, that they're actually on or act as mobile elements. Uh, and her second question was, with the Thor community, is that specific to the strains that you were using or do different strains of Bacillus and Flavobacterium and Pseudomonas uh, kind of recapitulate that effect? Yeah, that's a great question. We've done um, other strains of flavobacterium, we get the same response. And in fact, um, most of the data I showed you was with a flavobacterium that's the workhorse of uh, flavobacterium genetics that Mark McBride has uh, pioneered. So um, we find the same effect as long as we use other flavobacteria from soil con uh, conditions, which is where most of them come from. Um, the uh, bacillus, we haven't varied the bacillus very much. We know that bacillus subtilis will not do the same thing in most of our assays, but we haven't had a chance yet to check a lot of the other um, bacilli. The, the serious and, and uh, subtilis groups are very far apart as bacilli go, so um, we think that it may be specific to the, the other end. And Pseudomonas, it turns out, is much more promiscuous. We've been able to use several species of Pseudomonas and see very similar results. Um, so we see the joint biofilm production, and um, of course, others don't necessarily produce the same antibiotic, but we see um, inhibitory effects and protective effects. So we're actually looking at that right now with the Pseudomonas oriophations, and we've done a lot with Originosa, and both seem to I uh, have really interesting interactions with um, the Thor members. And I had a kind of a related question to that. Uh, when you do uh, kind of quantitative surveys of the rhizosphere community, do you recapitulate that dominance of Pseudomonas over the Pseudomonas and the, or over the Bacillus and the Flavobacterium? Is that kind of numerical ratio? Um, it, that does you, actually you know? vary with rhizospheres from what we've seen. Um, Pseudomonas is definitely dominant, but not to the extent that it is, it's not tenfold to twentyfold more abundant than the other two on roots. I, I don't have good data on that on Flavobacterium because we haven't done that much field analysis with Flavobacterium, the native Flavobacterium. Um, we've only done it with the hitchhikers coming into the lab. Um, but I doubt that we're going to see that same ratio, um, bec just because in the early experiments we saw, if we inoculated with uh, Bacillus in the field, we saw that flush of flavor bacterium and Cytophaga. Um, I doubt that they were um, in a minor population at that point. So it's a really great question that we should probably go back to the field and ask that. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so Laura Day asks, can you elaborate on how the initial conclusion of uh, new P PKS starter molecules for zwittermycin was arrived at? Uh, what was the first part of it? it? How the, how? How did you, how was the conclusion reached that you needed new PKS oh. modules? For oh gosh, um, actually Bill's probably better to ask, answer that than I am. Um, he, Michael Thomas could not find a way to add units to get the zwittermycin structure um, without having other um, donors. And so he just couldn't get it with the typical um, 
uh, malonium CoA, for example. If you could add those, you just you wouldn't get this watermycin structure. But if he came up with these other starters, then he could draw out exactly um, the the biosynthesis. And I'm sorry I can't do a better job than that, but. That was his inference um, that he couldn't make it happen using the genes. I mean, we had several of the genes at that point. Using the genes, the polyketide synthase genes, um, he just couldn't make the molecule with them alone if there wasn't that starter there. Yeah, having the final structure certainly makes the genome interpretation a lot easier yeah. than when you start with genes and wonder what they make. Um, Laura Suttonfield asks, um, what do you know about horizontal gene transfer between the members of your community? Oh, great question. The answer is nothing, but we'd love to um, look at that. We're, the two things that we're really interested in pursuing in terms of the very intimate interactions are whether they can share genes and also the nature of the hitchhiking, which we've never been able to um, dissect because we can't get it to happen in the lab. It only works when we're coming from the field. So it's really tough to study. But th that's, those are two of the intimate interactions that we, we haven't tackled. Great question. All right, uh, Alex Polidor wants to know, do Zorbs form without bacillus? Um, and how is it that the bacillus are able to hide out inside of the Zorbs? You know, what, what allows them to do that? Yeah, the Zorb result is relatively new. We haven't published it yet, so um, I can't tell you a ton. We know that Flavobacterium forms Zorbs by itself. We know that part of the gliding motility apparatus is required for Zorb formation. Um, we know that Bacillus gets inside, and the postdoc I mentioned, Chao Li, um, from his convocal microscopy believes, and but I, I put believes in quotes, that the bacillus drills into the zorbs. So the zorb forms and then bacillus drills in and gets itself inside. That's a little shaky, but that's the hypothesis at the moment. And we're trying to figure out a way to study exactly that. So yeah, that interaction is just stunning. And you'll probably ask next whether the pseudomonas affects the zorbs and that's in progress. Right, good. Uh, just a couple more. Um, what's the role for environmental DNA in the biofilm? And, and the person who asked this is wondering whether zwittermycin might be lysing pseudomonas uh, causing DNA release to help form the matrix of the biofilm. That's, yeah, that's a great question. We're doing the experiments to characterize the matrix right now. Um, we started with looking at extracellular um, polysaccharides and proteins. DNA is absolutely next. And we have an expert on campus who's um, studied eDNA on um, uh, plant roots in plant microbe interactions. So that's, that's going to be a really interesting one to pursue. All right, uh, one last question. Does the bi biofilm result suggest a possible existence of higher order interactions uh, between the three members? Yes. Absolutely. I, I think that is the conclusion and that's what we believe communities are, is the essence of, of community-ness is a higher order interaction where um, any two members cannot recapitulate what the community does, or even all of the pairs cannot recapitulate the, the threesome. So yes, I totally think they're responsible for higher order interactions. Right, and I, I want to ask just one final question. Have, have you thought about untargeted metabolomics uh, in most the different pairwise and full combination? Just to ask what small, what's the kind of sum total of the small molecules and how they interact? Yes, um, my chemistry postdoc uh, put those samples in the freezer and then went off to a job at Corteva in Indianapolis. And my new postdoc just started last week and he hasn't analyzed them yet. So we've got the metabolomics um, about to be run, about to be analyzed, and I'll know that soon. But that's, that we have actually two approaches to um, the, sort of a similar question, and that's using metabolomics and transcriptomics to look at the singles, the doubles, and the triple. And what is interesting with the transcriptomics, which is a little bit further along, is that we are turning up some of the same genes that we hit in the TNC screen um, as being community specific. 
Um, but we hit a lot more because we're not doing knockouts, of course. We're just looking at what's expressed. And then we also think that we're seeing some small molecule uh, regulation um, in um, uh, Pseudomonas, um, and we're going to be looking at that in metabolomics. There's an interesting um, theme in the, in the transcriptomics that Pseudomonas <clears throat> seems to talk to everybody, so it affects gene expression in Bacillus and Flavobacterium. Flavobacterium um, listens to everyone, responds enormously to everything that Bacillus and Pseudomonas put out, and Bacillus is kind of in between. So we think we have a continuum of organisms, one that, that spits out a lot of signals but doesn't listen very well, and one that listens a lot. It really needs to know what's going on in its environment, um, and then one that does both kind of in the middle. So I hope to have a, a, more, a more quantitative um, story of listening and, and uh, responding uh, next time I talk to you. This sounds a bit like a faculty meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in any case, um, Joe, I want to thank you very much uh, for that talk. Um, if you were here in person, you'd be hearing thunderous applause right now. <laughs> um, and we really hope that next time we can, we can get you down in person. Um, I so hope thanks so. Thanks very much for the you. talk. R really elegant, very nice. Thank you. It's always great to visit Illinois, even virtually. So, uh, so thanks a lot. Good to see you all. Thanks and hi, Paola. Bye-bye. <laughs>